So we're talking about wisdom. Why talk about wisdom today? Well, I, I've been echoing and I can feel what Paul was feeling. And, and he wrote a letter to the church in Colossae. And it was also shared with the nearby church of Laodicea. Now, Colossae is really cool. Um, I've been spending some time listening to some podcasts. It's one of my favorite books to just sit down and, and read or listen through the whole book. It's not that long. It takes 15 minutes to listen to it. Most of the beginning of it is about Jesus. But the second chapter is very specific. And Colossae, by the way, could have been as many as 40 people in the church. Doesn't that sound familiar? It wasn't the big city. It was the small country town church. Laodicea was the bigger city. If there was an earthquake that happened, and there was, the government funded Laodicea to be rebuilt. The government did not fund for Colossae to be rebuilt. So you can, that's just where they are. It kind of sounds familiar. But there's this battle that Paul talks about in the second chapter to keep people from influences of worldly wisdom, philosophy, thought patterns, and sometimes just good old-fashioned propaganda. I feel that battle as a pastor. I feel it just like Paul was feeling it. So what we need to know is what is biblical wisdom? Because there's definitely extremes. There's extreme conspiracy theories. There's extreme adherence to the government. I don't buy either one. I want what the Bible says. And when even when people are talking, you know what? There's a way to tell if someone's using biblical wisdom or not. We're going to look at that today. But let's just read that Colossians passage. So this is Colossians chapter 1, uh, or no, Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. So if you can turn to your Bibles there, Colossians chapter 2. Again, Colossae, not a big city, not an important town anymore, kind of more agricultural. Has good water, because they shipped a lot of their water to Laodicea. So again, wow, a lot of parallels. And I love this church. Paul has never even been to this church. It's that small. That's why he's writing them. He's writing them to encourage them. And this is how he starts. He says, let me tell you how hard I worked for you and for the people in Laodicea and for all others who don't know me personally. For those that want to know, I'm using the Good News translation because it's, just, it's an easier storytelling. And it just it's so relatable. I do this in order that they may be filled with courage and may be drawn together in love. And so they'll have the full wealth of assurance which true understanding brings. In this way, they'll know God's secret, which is Christ himself. He is the key to opening all hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you then, do not let anyone deceive you with false arguments, no matter how good they seem to be. For even though I am absent in body, I am with you in spirit, and I'm glad to see your resolute firmness which you stand together in your faith in Christ. Since you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, live in union with him. Keep your roots deep in him. Build your lives on him and become stronger in your faith as you were taught and be filled with thanksgiving. See to it then that no one enslaves you by the means of worthless deceit of human wisdom, which comes from teachers handed down by human beings, from ruling spirits to the universe, and not from Christ. For the full content of the divine nature lives in Christ, in his humanity. And you have been given life in union with him. He is supreme over every ruler and authority. Now that's the main message of Colossians. Jesus is supreme. He's number one. He's first. And it, there's lots of description about how he is first. And we would have read that if we read through chapter one. Or for the sake of time, I'm going to say, read this all on your own at home. So I want us that are in, in Eau Claire or connected to us. We have churches that are connected to us. We have other pastors that are watching this video. Um, and those who might actually see me on social media. I might not ever get to see you. I might not get to see you if you're on social media. I might probably do because let's just face it. It's not like we're getting thousands of viewers anyways. And that's not the point. The point is to encourage whoever we can in Christ and following him. But the same thing applies today. We do not want to be enslaved or cheated by the deceit that comes from human wisdom. False arguments. Philosophy not based on Jesus Christ. No matter how religious it may sound. There's some that sound really good, big religious words and everything. But it's still, as my dad would have said, bunk and balderdash. 
Has anyone ever heard that phrase before? Honk if you've heard that phrase outside. Okay, so some of you have, because it's not real. So let's look again. The fullness of wisdom is found in Jesus Christ. Can we see that from the verse that Dane read earlier? The wisdom that is first of all pure. It is also gentle, peaceable, friendly. It's full of compassion. It produces a harvest of good deeds. It is free from prejudice and hypocrisy. And goodness is the harvest that is produced from the seeds that those peacemakers plant in peace. However, to do that passage real justice, what should we do? We should read before and after. Because that sounds great, but what is it talking about? What's the context? This is great. It's telling James, Jesus' brother, is telling us about what human wisdom looks like or godly wisdom looks like. What else is he going to talk about? So I'm going to read. We can turn your Bibles to James, and we're going to read. We're not going to read through all of James 3 and 4. But if you're looking at James 3, and anyone who's familiar with that book of the Bible knows James chapter 3. Isn't that talking a lot about the tongue? Yes, it is. It's talking about the words that we speak. And worldly wisdom and godly wisdom actually shows quite quickly in the words that we speak and the actions we take. Yeah. Some people who are, they proclaim to be wise are all talk, but the actions don't correspond. That's not, that's not supposed to be us. So we go ahead to James chapter 3 and we're, we're going to start as he actually transitions into talking about wisdom in verse 13. So it's 3.13 in James. Are there any of you among you who is wise in understanding? He's to prove it by his good life and his good deeds performed with humility and wisdom. But if in your heart you are jealous, bitter, and selfish, don't sin against the truth by boasting about your wisdom. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven. It belongs to the world. It is unspiritual and demonic. Where there is jealousy, selfishness, and where there is also disorder, there is every kind of evil. So this form of wisdom isn't very teachable. It's not very teachable. It focuses primarily on my own opinions and is usually not active in deeds, but pointing the finger at other people. That's worldly wisdom. Lots of talk. Most of it negative. And I'm sure we've all been around that and exposed to that. Whereas the verses afterwards tell us about godly wisdom. Now, where does that wisdom lead us? Is now we can read, we read the verses before, let's read the verses after. Because remember, if we read before and after, we can get a much better sense of what God is telling us in passages. Besides, remember, chapter, verse, not original. So in chapter 4, James goes on to say, Where do your fights and quarrels come from? They come from your desires for pleasure, which are constantly fighting in you. You want things, but you can't have them, so now you're ready to kill. You strongly desire things, but you can't get them, so you quarrel and fight. You do not... Have what you want because you don't ask God for it. When you do ask, you still don't receive it because your motives are bad. Because you're asking things only for your own pleasure. Unfaithful people. Exclamation point here, by the way. I didn't say it the way it should. So it'd be unfaithful people. Don't you know that the world's friend means to be God's enemy? If you want to be the world's friend... That makes you yourself God's enemy. Now, it's not saying that you can't have friends that are not Christian here. Some people have used this one verse and said that. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, is your choice of philosophy and the way that you act biblical or non-biblical? If you want to be the world's friend, you make yourself God's enemy. Don't think there is no truth in the scripture that says, the spirit God placed in us is filled with fierce desires. But the grace of God is even stronger. The scripture says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So then submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, hypocrites. Be sorrowful and cry and weep. Change your laughter into crying and your joy into gloom. That's the people that are always making jokes of everything. There's sometimes to be serious, and it's okay. 
Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll lift you up. Don't criticize one another, my friends. If you criticize or judge another Christian, you criticize and judge the law. And if you judge the law, you're no longer one who obeys the law, but one who judges it. God's the only law, the only lawgiver and judge. He alone can save or destroy. Who do you think you are to judge someone else? So all of that human wisdom points us in this direction. I know better than you. And at the root of it is I know better than God. Where does that come from? Well, that comes from the choice to eat the fruit that Eve took and Adam didn't do anything. Because it wasn't so much the bad that they were looking at it, it was the good. I can be like God. I can do, I can be a God and, and be just like him, but we can't. And that's where the failure is. And then instead of working together as humans in a teamwork with God and each other, it wasn't long before humanity started to enslave other humans and to put other humans down. In fact, with Adam and Eve and their, their marriage relationship, they started the blame game right away. It wasn't my fault. It was this woman you gave me. And then what did you do? Well, it wasn't my fault. It was this creature that you created and left in the garden. So really, it's your fault. Let's look one more at the godly wisdom. I mean, we, we could probably spend more time talking about the negative, but let's look at the positive. What is godly wisdom like? What are we aiming at? Going back to the original passage, we're just going to kind of expand. What do these words mean? And can we put it all together in a way that sometimes it makes more sense? We just stop and look. What did it mean? So I'm not going to read every Greek word, but I'll tell you kind of what they mean. Because that's just going to be painful to anyone that does know Greek if they ever hear this video. Because it's, it's not going to sound right. And anyone else in here, you might be going, well, Pastor Jed, that's all Greek to me. Well, it is, but, you know. So when it begins, it says, but the wisdom that is above is first pure. There's two words this time to describe pure. We only have one, but it is pure. The first word means to be certain or true. So this is for certain. So when people of, of wisdom speak, they speak out of a certainty. And the second word has to do with exciting people to live modestly, reverently before God. So when you put the two words together, it's a pure wisdom that is true, it is certain, and it leads to a greater reverence and respect for God, for God apart from the ways of the world, in modesty. So it's not flowery, doesn't have to be fancy words. It's just true words. And sometimes that's a flag for me when someone has to use big words to prove their point. That, that is a flag for me. I just like, okay, can you put that into simpler terms? Or can you put that in your own words? Or are you only speaking someone else's? This type of wisdom just make sense because it's true and it's pure. It's not built upon skepticism. The next word is gentle, and other words from that is mild, fair, fair is another one. There's a lot of people that cry about fairness. I mean, that's, that's what the core of a lot of the social justice issues is, is everything has to be fair. But a lot of times what social justice means is, it's not fair that you have more than me, so now I'm going to take what you have and give it to me. Now that's not fair either. Not that I'm not for, I love the idea of Things being fair. Mild, gentle. So heavenly wisdom is not picking favorites or sides, but is fair, mild, and just gentle. Gentle. So you see somebody that's coming across and they're trying to prove their point, and you can tell it on their face that the gentleness is gone, and there's no gentleness in this because their face looks angry or mean. It's okay to be passionate about something, but if that debate is heading down to a quarrelsome place, we're supposed to abandon those kind of things. Friendly is another word in this translation. Easy to be entreated is another English translation. And even still, that's like, well, that doesn't really help me. While it's easily obeying, compliant, trainable, and teachable. So wisdom that comes from above is trainable in the things of God. You're like, oh, I heard that. Doesn't matter who says it. Could be somebody that just 
yesterday they gave their life to Jesus, but now they're proclaiming truth, truth, and you're going, I never thought of it that way before. Wow, that's awesome. Whereas you're going, the other approach would be, well, you know, you're just a new Christian. How do you know anything? That's, that's out there. I have faced that. The next word, meaning full, is for the next two. So when it says full of compassion, it also means full of good deeds. We, this kind of wisdom is full of compassion, which is kindness, goodwill towards specifically miserable and afflicted people. So a desire to be joined and help people that are being marginalized. That's actually what godly wisdom is. Does that sound like all the actions of the church over the past 200 years? No. No. Like if you were to look up, and, and I've, I've been spending a lot of time reading about next generation um, and, and ones that really have no religious affiliation. And, you know, the first three words that come up when they say, like, what are, what are some of the words that, you know, describe a Christian? The first one generally is, like, anti-homosexual. That's like 87 or 90 percent. The second one is judgmental. Um, all the way down to the last one, which is about 60%, say confusing. We need some godly wisdom injected people that shows compassion. Doesn't mean that we approve of everything that's being done, but we still have compassion on people. We realize you're being marginalized. We should have compassion on people that are immutable compromise right now, and we should have compassion on people that do not want to have a vaccine. We should have compassion on both. <clears throat> Why? Because that's what it's saying scripturally. And both are being marginalized. Mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel strongly for people that um, read lips right now. Oh. It's got to be hard for them. It's got to be hard. So full of compassion, exercising mercy. And full of good deeds. And these are good and upright and honorable deeds or fruits. So godly wisdom in a person leads to, inwardly, an attitude of goodwill towards people. Just goodwill towards people, inwardly. That is godly wisdom. <clears throat> Doesn't mean you're not like, well, I have goodwill to them, you, you, even though you know that that person is wicked. No, you still, but you know that that person is lost without Jesus. And then the next part of it is, is we also take... Outwardly, that heavenly wisdom will lead us to be full of good and upright deeds and fruits. Like, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. That's, those are all action words whenever we read that in, in Galatians. And then it says, it also, there's goodness in the harvest of wisdom, godly wisdom. This is the second time the word fruit or good deeds shows up. So there's a path, there's a word in the Greek that's being repeated. Pay attention. Pay attention. So this time, the fruit is goodness, which is better translated to righteousness or being prone to do what is right. As a man, we get it right every time. But we're prone or we're, we're trained and we like to do what is right. Even if it costs us, we still do what is right because that's the way we're trained. And the seeds of heavenly wisdom are sown in peace by people who are known for their peaceful ways. So what is that word peace? It, it helps to look it up. It's not shalom. It's not Hebrew. It's a Greek word. And it's people who walk in a state of tranquility, harmony, and working for uni unity. That sounds cool. But what is it not? Sometimes it's better. Anyone ever, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one. Sometimes you got to know what it's not in order to know what it truly is. And it's not people who are quarreling, fighting, or given to debating all the time. That's not godly wisdom. Godly wisdom is not going to lead us down that road. So let's put it together. This is the expanded version from all those notes that I just put. Um, so the wisdom that is from above, godly wisdom, is a pure wisdom that is true and certain and leads one to a greater reverence and respect for God, apart from the ways of the world. Worldly wisdom will give us, oh, God, you're so good. And it does it in modesty. It doesn't need fancy words. It doesn't need flowery language. It can use them, but it doesn't have to. It's a wisdom that has a, a fair and mild attitude. It's a wisdom that is trainable and teachable. In other words, there's another way of saying that. This person knows they don't know it all. And I don't just say it in a way, well, I know that I don't know everything, but 
No, no, no. <laughs> Their attitude comes out and it says, I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to learn. Godly wisdom in a person leads them to, to goodwill and mercy on the inside as an attitude, and it leads them to outward actions full of good and upright deeds. And this, this book, James, gives actually all kinds of great examples. So I gave some possible homework to people. Read Colossians. You can read James. There, I've given you a half hour's worth of reading for the week. Because James is another. I love reading the book of James when I'm in the dentist's office or the, or the doctor's office. Because it always, they tell you to show up at the appointment and you know you got 15 to 20 minutes to sit there and wait. So, perfect time to read James. It's a wisdom that is totally sincere, without prejudice, without hypocrisy. It doesn't need to wear a disguise. There's no disguise in godly wisdom. And it's a wisdom that's planted by people of peace, by peace, and brings forth good fruits. A feeling, good fruits in the way you speak, good fruits in what you're saying and doing. It's just, it's right. And people will want to be around that. Unless, of course, they are on the worldly wisdom side, then they won't want to be around it. Think the Pharisees. They walked a lot by this pattern. All of their thoughts were religious thoughts, but they were off because they were missing the actual wisdom of God. In my office, there's a saying that I put up almost at the very beginning of being a pastor, and it says, never underestimate the teachable the faithful, and the humble. And the person who taught me that was when I was in Thailand with Marvin Enos and, um, and the, the work that he was doing in Thailand. And here I am, a Bible school student, and I'm learning from my mentor. And he says, okay, see all these people here? And this is the, the, the top of the group. These are the, the third-year students. These are the ones that are actively already engaged in ministry. And he's pointing me out all these groups, and he points to one guy and he said, you see that guy? I like that guy. He's the one I want to keep the most doesn't have any real skill. He's not a good preacher. He doesn't sing, but he is faithful, he is teachable, and he's humble. Mm -hmm. So he shows up, he listens, and he just does the best he can. That's what that means. I still stand by that phrase. And that's what I'm looking for in people when I want to encourage them. Mm -hmm. I'm learning to not do the, as much I've had the other times where I'm trying to encourage people that are not faithful, teachable, and humble, and it's just like, why is my head sore? Well, because I've been banging it against the wall. <laughs> but the disciples are like that too. The disciples may not have been much. Ragtag group, fishermen, mama's boys, nobodies. Like, when you, you find that out when you, you, you play the game I Spy with the Biblical Eye, can you name all 12 disciples? It's not as easy as it sounds. You can easily do the 12 tribes of Israel quite often, but the 12 disciples, it's only mentioned a couple times. Because some of these guys, unless you know church history, that's like, what did they do? But they made a difference in the world. And I believe it's because they walked in godly wisdom, because the Holy Spirit was in them. And that includes that they were faithful, teachable, and humble, even when they were making mistakes. And we can see this one last point. We can see this in the book of Galatians, and I'll tell the story, because Paul is in this, this church, and he says, everybody eats together. They all share together. There's Jewish Christians. There's non-Jewish Christians. They all just share and eat. And But there's a few there that are like, I don't know. I, I just, I can't eat with those people. I can't eat with the Gentiles. And then Peter shows up, and Peter is like one of the top guys. He spent, he's one of three Jesus' most important disciples. And just Peter sits down and he has trouble too. He starts to eat with the Jewish people. And Paul calls him out. Remember, Jesus calls people out. He did that. We did that a couple weeks ago. Paul calls, gets caught. He's like, Peter, what do you think you're doing? Because <clears throat> when you're leading by example this way, now everybody's going to want to do what you're doing. And who's going to be left out? The Gentiles. And you know what Peter did? He took it. And he changed. He didn't fight Paul. He knew he was wrong. He took it and he made a difference. Teachable, faithful, humble. That's the short version of God the wisdom.
So Lord, we ask you today that we would be filled with godly wisdom. We want to follow you. We want to do it and be aware where the enemy would try and throw his propaganda, his ways of doing things at us. But we want to follow you. So we ask, Lord, and it says also in James, if you're lacking wisdom to ask, but don't doubt. So we ask in faith, not doubting, that you are going to make us more of a wise and discerning group of followers on Jesus on mission to the world. Thanks, Lord. Amen.